Good evening, y'all, and welcome to Unleashed, the panel discussion show on the Walkout Network. As you can see, we are without our Captain Ant Walker this evening, but I'm your host for the evening, Ben Duffy. With this is a stellar panel. We have returning for the third time. Is it the third time? I, I think third time, yeah, sounds about right. Juice Vargas of the iFox with Juice podcast, one of the sharpest minds in the game, and a man who you can tell by his posture is in the witness protection program right now. How you doing, Juice? <laughs> All right, just trying to keep a low profile, man. Don't don't blow up the spot. Understood. <laughs> with us also is the man with the stats, the facts, and the statistics, SureDog Associate Editor Jay Petri. Jay, how are you doing? I'm doing good. I, I think we're gonna have a lot of fun tonight. Um, you know, Ant's doing his thing, so uh, we'll we'll run the ship while he's while he's off today. So. Allow me to present to you my stat of the week. Stat of the week is four. Four of the last five fights for Valentina Shevchenko have seen her coming into the bout as a minus 1,100 favorite or higher. Four of her last five fights. The only one that wasn't was when she fought Joanna. So she is a massive favorite in this fight this weekend. It is interesting that you mention that because uh, as one of my duties at SureDog, I uh, maintain the belt history infographics showing, you know, each division's belt from where it started to how it got where it is now. And one of the things I mentioned was this will be the third straight title defense that Shevchenko has been at least uh, minus 1000 favorite, you know, depending on on where you're looking at the book. So definitely if she wins ongoing problems for that division if she loses at least they have an immediate rematch to make and it <laughs> kind of alleviates the pressure to, to find uh someone else to step up now that macy barber's got an l and uh and an ACR. <laughs> hey roxy All what right. are you doing <laughs> oh, don't, don't do all right so we have next to nothing to talk about so we should dive right in uh and we will go with the best named segments in all of mixed martial arts media. I'm not surprised, Mr. Falcons, wherein we share something that happened over the past week or the past weekend in the world of combat sports that surprised us. Uh, this past weekend was a little thin on the major events front, though we did have offerings from One Championship and Legacy Fighting Alliance, but plenty of other things went on. So... Uh, Jay, let's start with you. What is your I'm not surprised Mr. Falcon's moment? So, yeah, LFA and one championship were both kind of sparse. So I'm going to break away for a second. I'm going to go over into the other, the sweet science. Um, PBC boxing happened this past weekend. And I'm going to talk about one man who used to fight in MMA, uh, Clay Collard. He is a former UFC featherweight, fought Max Holloway and a couple other guys uh, before leaving the company. So he became a pro boxer. And he is a master re a record of six, two, and three draws. So, okay, that's fine. He's been the guy that, that organizations have been using to kind of uh, bring in as a journeyman type with a, a sort of a recognizable name with a UFC they can attach to and say, oh, he was in the UFC before this. So he, he, he fights these young up-and-comers, these unbeaten guys. And I did a little digging, obviously. His opponents have combined for a record of 59 and three before taking him on. So he has been fighting some young studs. So he fought this unbeaten 5-0 and kid named Raymond uh, Guyardo, and he riggedy wrecked this guy, like, shockingly. Like, he's just, he, he was, it was the Andy Wang dream fight. He stood and he <laughs> banged. It was shocking. Because, you know, he, he was like, a, I think it was a 14 and 7 or so MMA fighter, didn't have a standout performance to speak of. Uh, so he stood in front of this Raymond kid, I think it was about 19 or so, and just brawled with him. He dropped him twice. He got knocked down. Round ends, and he hits the rap by accident. Oh, whoops, what a big deal. So he gets and he blitzes the kid and finishes him in the second round. So I mention all this because this is Clay Collard's retirement fight from boxing because he's going to return to MMA where he wants to sign with the Professional Fighters League at the lightweight division and win a million dollars. So Clay Collard, I'm not surprised. I'm I am genuinely surprised that he's doing what he's doing in boxing, has a decent record fighting unbeaten kids, and now he's decided, I'm going to get my payday. So good for you, Clay Collard. 
Excellent. Uh, are you ready to offer yours up, Juice? Um, yeah, so if I'm really not being surprised, it's uh, I guess it's not necessarily a fight, but I don't even know where the event took place, but a video kind of went viral of uh, Gervonta Davis um, physically assaulting a woman. Uh, that I guess was his baby mama at, at some fight. I don't know if it was that that Jake Paul fight. I I, I don't know where it was, but regardless, um, I just it it was a weird thing to see the the, the people acted rightfully. There were so many women in the shot that 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 they filmed that you you just saw utter horror on their face and nothing was done around him. And I don't know. It just seems like those people around the, uh, that were that were near him in that area just they weren't surprised either. It just seems like this is a common occurrence, and it just makes you wonder if he's willing to do some shit like this in public. What the hell is he doing in private? Yeah. That you know, he, it's not just that. Oh, okay. Obviously, everyone has their phones out. Anyone can record it. But this is a televised boxing event. I mean, anybody could catch this. And apparently, it was not a boxing event. It was some charity celebrity basketball game down in miami oh jesus okay well yeah regardless phones are everywhere so yeah it uh, yeah (laughs) i mean i'm with you on like the and to those watching this show that have not seen the video we're talking about even at like shaky cam phone video at kind of a distance it is shocking to watch yeah like it, <laughs> this, it, this isn't like a, a little bit of roughhousing. This was mm-hmm. vicious. No, like what an asshole. And it's, yeah, no, go ahead, go ahead, man. Well, I'm. This is not some like washed up dude that's like on his way to Skid Row. He is a young up and coming boxer. He's might be the well, assuming he's a free man, might be the next guy to fight Vasil Lomachenko. He's he's a good up and coming boxer and throwing it all away and i mean you can probably speak to this but he wasn't exactly contrite or uh penitent about this in the aftermath either he doubled the hell down (laughs) yeah so apparently he he made a statement on instagram or something saying basically that it was justified and she had it coming and um you know y'all were just lucky that you had people holding me back type thing. And, uh, but also he deleted his Instagram as of now. Uh, I'm, I'm sure that'll be up very soon. And I'm sure he was getting many threats by many people that can really hurt him, uh, given where he's from and probably where this girl's from. But, uh, yeah, that was, it was just, nothing really surprises me in prize fighting anymore, whether that's boxing or MMA or sometimes kickboxing. Cause they can be real crazy down there too. But this is like, Jesus Christ, man. <laughs> um, you know, and, th- and then obviously we've seen things like terrible things like um, well, who was a football player a few years back who knocked Ray, the, Rice. Uh, Ray, Ray Rice. Rice. You know, we've seen things like that. Obviously, that's a different sport. But it, it, I, I, not to justify that guy in any way because there's no defense for that. But it's like, OK, it was in a it was in a elevator probably didn't think those cameras and that was not right what he did but it's like okay i'm not trying to do this in front of everyone this dude was just i think his only thing is well well, like yeah i didn't hit her so what's the big deal (laughs) choke slammer i mean yeah he grabbed her by the neck like there's no you can you can clearly see what's going on here so yeah this is this 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 should be a big deal i think that's that's kind of where i'm standing with that and it's a fresh enough story that it may turn out to be. I mean, it's sometimes three or four days later that we hear that there's been an arrest. Yeah, so. there's nothing as of yet, right? I haven't right. caught anything. Yeah. Not to my knowledge. And here's the other thing that, like, there's been some talk recently in MMA. I mean, it seems like it always comes up with, I think the last story was with Mike Perry and you know him dropping the M bomb and all that and why isn't the UFC doing anything? Why haven't they cut him or find him or suspended him or whatever and nothing happened to him. But in boxing there really is no ramifications. I mean he's not beholden to anybody. So no. unless uh, the only thing that can happen is for law enforcement to step in and if they don't, and I don't see why they wouldn't unless she doesn't press charges or nothing. He's a free man and he's just gonna keep doing what he's gonna do. 
I there's not a whole lot there I can argue. <laughs> My I'm not surprised Mr. Falcon's moment for the week is notably lighter in tone. The one championship fire and fury event went down this past weekend in Manila, which is kind of their the promotions home away from home. They do a lot of events in Manila. Continuing one championships streak of extremely cheesy event names. But once again, they uh, posted their weigh-in results and hydration test results. Everybody made weight. One fighter uh, missed his initial hydration test. No word on whether he had to retake it or some other ramification. But as baby steps in this promotion's movement towards greater transparency greater adherence to some sort of rules where they are accountable to the, to the public. It was an encouraging thing. We're still waiting for the big test and the big test will be when one of their own stated guidelines threatens one of their own big fights, because whatever else you can say about the UFC, the UFC has had to scratch events because of John Jones. There were no rules that, they, well, the, the one time that they moved the event from Vegas to LA, but they were never able to just wave, hand wave something away and say it didn't happen. They are at least theoretically uh, accountable to, uh, to outside regulators. Once one championship gets into the, that situation for the first time, where it's, oh, you're going to lose a Demetrius Johnson fight if this doesn't happen or you're going to lose a stamp fair text fight, you know, if you really own up to the fact that she missed weight or missed hydration, we'll see what, what they do then. But I am cautiously optimistic and encouraged. So that is my, I'm not surprised Mr. Falcon's uh, moment for the weekend. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, I, I didn't, man, I swear I'd, I've never caught like one, even the, even the century one I've seen like maybe two fights. I've just, Really don't catch up much with one, but yeah, it, it just kind of brings up a funny thought that uh, maybe when they actually make news in that way, you know, someone, well, I can't say not making way because I guess that doesn't seem to matter. But yeah, for whatever reason, a fight is canceled. Maybe that's when they'll start to get a reputation like, oh, maybe we should, they should be respected a little bit, right? Well, they, they were talking about wanting to put on shows in the United States in 2020. If, I, guess. <laughs> I mean, Man. I think they'll come up against it pretty quickly if they do that i mean yeah. unless they come yeah. to texas <laughs> they, no man they want new york they want california like they like they're going for the jurisdictions that are gonna they're gonna be sticklers for that so that's that's yes. gonna be i almost want to say a culture shock just in terms of the regulation that's presented to them that they no longer will be able to i mean uh, we're talking make their own if they want to if they want to go to new york we're talking about a commission that gave uh Max Holloway an eyeball hydration test from six feet away and said, you're not allowed to cut any more weight. Um, it's like one championship is definitely going to be in for some culture shock. If, if they put on an event there. Chap and, lips. That's still yeah. the one that comes to mind. Chap lips. Chap lips, the implants, a whole bunch of those cancellations they've handed out. Mm -hmm. I uh, love that you brought, uh, Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Ben. No, no. I, what were you saying? I was gonna say I love that you brought up John Jones and uh, the 232 incident because I'm not gonna lie, uh, for I've been watching MMA for about 10 years and even before that with boxing I kind of knew what it should show the Texas Department of License Regulation was, and I I would honestly just crack jokes and I was on my high on my high horse of we're in California we do everything right look at those those idiots down in Texas and how they do <laughs> shit and I can't say things I can't say anything anymore and I'm I'm like yeah, I'm just Staying quiet about commission stuff now. We're better than Louisiana. Louisiana's right <laughs> next door. That, that place is a toxic waste dump of, of regulation. TDLR, better than, better than Louisiana. Yes. Better than Louisiana. <laughs> That's the slogan. That's, yep. Diego Sanchez and Ovin St. Pru were both recently handed three-month sentences after testing positive for what were determined to be tainted supplements. Is there any rhyme or reason to USADA suspensions anymore? Jay, what do you think? 
man, if we're talking about regulation here, we're gonna we're swinging the other direction, I think, because I am legitimately confused by the application of the rules as they USADA as an agency uh, presents them and and enforces them. I when the same substance. The granted, there's a few there's a few mitigating circumstances, but when the same substance, a tainted supplement for osterine, which is not an easy thing to to accidentally take, um, when one fighter, a Jessica Penne type, will be suspended for four years for an allegedly tainted supplement from osterine, Sean O'Malley will be suspended nine months from the Nevada State Athletic Commission or the California State Athletic Commission. Uh, nine months. Uh, USADA gave him six months. For tainted supplements with osterine in them. Diego Sanchez, Ovin St. Pru, three months for tainted supplements with osterine in them. Now, you can look at them, okay, you can say, well, the commission handed that in nine months, so maybe that's different. Old rules and the new rules, because USADA uh, changed the thresholds of, what do they call it, performance-enhancing standard, where you can have these microscopic levels in your system, and they can, they, the agency, can somehow determine this tiny amount will not influence performance. What that threshold exactly is, I don't know. Uh, they could exist, but I, I, I truly don't know. It, it, it's not quite the same comparison. Uh, but when drug laws in the United States were changed, sentences in some states were commuted. I know Oklahoma, uh, for example, uh, commuted many sentences for marijuana possession and paraphernalia and that kind of thing when the laws change to allow for re uh, recreational use. So is this that USADA is saying, we're allowing these these levels now, so you're okay, new fighters? But there are other fighters under suspension for these same substances. And it's just, the questions that we have, or at least I have, are just, it doesn't, it doesn't make it sense how sense. everything's being applied. It, it, it It's also, to me, this is this is where I'm going to go a little skeptic mode. These these sentences just so happen to not affect the perform the the appearances of these fighters. Diego Sanchez is fighting next week. His suspension just ended. Well, that's interesting. Did 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 the UFC know this and plan around it? No, because it was in Albuquerque, which is his home area. So that just that kind of and he's the co-main event against Michelle Bajeda. So it's. I personally hope that USADA was going to bring transparency to the system that was a little cloudy, you know, make sense of some of the situations and make it so a commission A and commission C see things differently, but at least we can have a, a neutral ground in the middle that they can, they can investigate and look into these things. But no, the USADA is paid by the UFC. The USADA is not a, an independent third party organization as much as we wish it would be. I, I think it's gotten cloudier. Because we don't know if a fighter is going to test positive for something and get flagged for a year, six months, two years. That it doesn't make sense. There is no rhyme or reason for me. I, I'm I'm with you. All I have after this recent rash of stories, Saint Peru, Sanchez, Penne, I have two questions. One. Where the fuck are you getting these supplements that have osterine in them? Show me on what shelf at GNC I can find them, because that would be that would be really good for me to know on a personal <laughs> level. You know, not even asking for a friend, asking for myself. If I can find some, you know, some selective androgen receptor modulators uh, in my over-the-counter supplements, that would that would really put a boost into my personal regimen. So, get at me, please, all all you recently busted fighters. Show show me, you know. Like, just pose on your Instagram with, like, the canister. Uh, <laughs> item number two, I'm with you, Jay. Where's the transparency? Like, I can deal with it if the regulations are harsh and they're enforced in a draconian manner. I just want to know by what rationale these decisions were made. Right. If one fighter got a nine-month suspension and one got a three-month suspension for what, according to the reports, were the same offense... Mm -hmm and there were no publicly known mitigating or aggravating factors, then just tell me why it's different. Explain. Th th that's, that's all I want out of it, and that is what they thus far have not really delivered in any kind of satisfactory manner. So that sucks. It's all been a generic answer of due to cooperation and, 
and uh, depend th- through the investigation, they provide. This is a this is a blanket thing I've read multiple times for these different tainted supplements cases, where where athlete A has presented a sealed container of these supplements, and it didn't have it listed on the label, and then they came out for them. The, the substances tested positive for SARMs or or Osterine or HCG one zero three three or whatever exactly it was, and then your assistance to determine, oh, I took these stupid things for doing the same thing is more impactful on your case than another fighter doing the exact same things. Like the information presented from USADA is very boilerplate, which is fine, understandable. But you can't hand out two different sentences with the same identical explanation. It just doesn't work for me. What I want to do is I I just want to do a quiz where I throw out a bunch of letter and number strings like HCZ1903362 and have people have to guess whether it is a substance banned by USADA or the Twitter handle of somebody that argues with Ant. (laughs) I would go 0 for 8. (laughs) (laughs) They'd probably all be people that argue with Ant. That'd be the the trick. It's it's always some asshole that joined in like November of 2019 and has like it's the generic, eight. yeah, and and just the generic like three letters and eight number like u- username. Anyway, LGD four zero three three. That's the one. Yeah, that's a uh, real one. That, that, that's my homie actually. I just. <laughs> <laughs> All right, pivoting abruptly. Uh, Kamaru Usman and Jorge Masvidal. Ooh your UFC welterweight champ and your UFC welterweight man of the year recently had a public dust up followed by a bunch of social media jawing at each other swing or miss juice. The recent altercation between Usman and Masvidal was prearranged. Mm, um, yeah, I've, I've been battling with this a lot over the past week and I talked about it on my show and I really didn't know what to say, but yeah, I'm just I'm actually just gonna go with uh with swing only because of their managers. Um Masvidal has Abraham Kawa and Usman has Ali Abdelaziz and uh we know they like to be on the spotlight and we know that they like to hype you know hype up their fighters in what what would you say, uh, unusual ways or or you know, not not, not the in the typical ways, and then you know with a uh, Del Aziz, and I I think with Masvidal in general too. I think they both run their social media accounts. So, I yeah I I do I think it was totally faked, and they were like in the back talking it out, and and this was like WWE type stuff. Like, not necessarily. I I really do think that they do not like each other. I but I definitely think they played it up, and I definitely think it was probably Aziz and Kawa pulling some strings behind the curtains type thing because yeah i don't i don't know like i really like usman i think he's a he's a i think he's a nice guy family guy i i I really like after all his fights like i did not like him going into the willie fight and after his fight i became a fan Uh, i liked him in the covington fan and the covington fight obviously as as many people did but it just seems this thing (laughs) is like heading into a fight everyone hates him and then he wins and a lot of people like him, and then he goes back to his same old bullshit, and people hate him again. It, it's it's a very strange thing. And then with Masvidal recently, I mean, you know, he's got his mezcal out, he got that Versace robe, and that the the Connor fight, and he's playing it up, man. I mean, he he wants money fights. He knows that this is the fight that's coming up next, and he just wants to assure it. I mean, did he did he think that socking up Leon Edwards was gonna get him a big fight next? No, but as he saw, it didn't hurt. So I think he's just kind of going, if he can create viral one, that's the thing is like, I, 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 I give him props that he, he would always mention after the Askren fight that like, I just needed like a viral moment. Yeah. I've been in this shit forever. Nobody paid attention. Nobody even knew who I was. But since I got this crazy knockout against a guy that not a lot of people liked it, it, you know, I became like a fan favorite and that's all it took. So I think now he's just like, well, I can always be bigger. Why not play it up a bit? So, yeah, swing. Swing on my end. Jay? Well, I'm going to have to, I don't have quite the thing, put on my tinfoil hat. And also, swing. I I feel that this 
beef, this this altercation, this squawking back and forth felt false and transparent that they suddenly have this beef. And then, oh, hey, Dana announces on the Jim Rome show, oh, the, the fight's happening in July. So we don't have a UFC card scheduled following UFC 250, which is going to take place in May in Sao Paulo, Sao Paulo Brazil. So we're announcing a fight in July, despite having everything that comes in between it. And, and you're going to do this right when they happen to slap each other around. It felt too, or they didn't even slap each other around. They just yelled at each other. They just kind of barked. Um, it, it just, it, it feels like marketing. It feels like the following the playbook that, that, that the most effective way to sell a fight is through animosity. So Joe Rogan can say they legitimately don't like each other. You should see them at the press conference when they were yelling at each other. You should see them at the weigh-ins when he pushed him. You know, that kind of dynamic, the the the, the formulaic, everything like that. The tension is palpable in here. We have the and then they get the little the the the, the extra security detail. They get the giant bald guy that stands in the middle to go like this to to make sure they're not gonna touch each other because they're really gonna they're totally gonna shove each other, guys. It just feels played out now. It it, it's the kind of thing that the UFC is going to say, oh, they shouldn't have been saying mean things. And then they'll play the footage of their altercation to hype up the fight. That, that shows the populace, these guys have been feuding for months now. This is for real. You should see them in January. They were yelling mean things at each other. It, I, didn't, I didn't know that Kamara Usman was the kind of fighter that hates all of his opponents. I didn't, that, he, that wasn't him, right? Unless I'm remembering incorrectly... He was relatively quiet about his business, professional. He'd get on the post-fight interview after he won it, and he'd say, I'm a problem, and then he moved on to the next fight. That That's how I remembered Kabar Usman. So to suddenly have Champ Usman screaming at people and, and, and wanting to fight them, it just feels like a character. I, I don't know. It, it, maybe it's just, you know, I mean, Juice, you're right on the money that Masvidal needed that moment, that Boom, I'm on camera, and here, look at me now. And Usman had the, the Colby thing, too, that, I don't know, it just feels all hammed up. It feels acted. It doesn't quite feel WWE, like, like quite as scripted. Maybe the UFC didn't have their hand in it, but I don't know. I just, uh, am I more, I, here's the, the, the question that I'll ask you, Ben. Are you more, would you be more excited about an usman Masvidal fight if you knew they didn't like each other? No. Okay. Because it doesn't change the probable outcome of the fight. Mm -hmm. I'm I'm with both of you. It does. I mean, it doesn't feel scripted. This isn't right. professional wrestling. It absolutely feels forced and contrived. Mm -hmm. And the disappointing thing about that is that throughout Masvidal's incredible breakout year that he had last year, where he stepped from being a cult favorite to the hot, you know, the hottest property in the sport since uh, McGregor didn't fight at all last year. None of it ever felt forced. It was right. completely natural. He was the same dude he always was for 10 years, and just all the stars finally aligned for him. I mean, the star making moment was him throwing a combination of punches, whose trade name I will not say on air. At Leon Edwards, but Edwards wasn't his opponent last that night. He was fresh off of knocking out Darren Till. And he didn't hate Darren Till. I don't remember a damn thing they said during the buildup. It was one of the best victories of his career, if not the best up until that moment. And then he made his star turn with a completely unscripted moment. Because I cringe away from being like that white dude in his literal armchair that fetishizes guys that are hard and are from the streets. <laughs> because I think that's corny as hell. But he is that guy. I mean, I don't have to project anything onto him to say that he's willing to throw down in the street because literally the first thing he is famous for is fighting people in the street in unlicensed fights. You know, he was beating up Kimbo Ray. Slice's protege Ray in a backyard you know, before he ever 
stepped into mixed martial arts. He is that guy. One of the interesting sound bites I remember from him way back in 2008 or 2009, or maybe a little later, maybe right around the time he was made victim of the most memorable season one Bellator moment. He was like talking about what it felt like to finally be getting known a little bit because he was already a 20 fight veteran by that point. And he was like, I'm not comfortable with it. Where I come from, strangers don't just come up to you and say, hey, how you doing, Jorge? You know, and so I'm having to adjust to that. He, he is that guy. I don't have to project it onto him. And that was what was cool about him. And again, like I am cringing at myself for saying that, but it's not because he's gangster or something. It's just because he was a completely real and honest guy who reflected where he came from and what kind of people he liked to hang around with. And that has changed. You know, you, still... you know, go and hit hit me. What you got? Oh no, I was just gonna say, Ben. Like, you know, you actually brought up an interesting point that, yeah, I mean, we all know that Masvidal's a street dude, and yeah, he literally was a street fighter. But uh, come to think of someone like Nate Nate Diaz, I know that you know, obviously that was his last opponent. I know that he's pulled out of fights recently because his opponents pulled out and this, that, and whatever. But that's the thing about the Diaz brothers that that's why they're so popular and so polarizing is that. They get in fights in the stands of <laughs> MMA events just for the fuck of it. And, you know, they don't give a yeah. shit if they're going to get sanctioned, fined, in jail. They just see a guy they don't like. And, you know, like, it's, I think even people who didn't know about Diaz back in the day, I think even they know about that little interview where, who was his name? Uh, per- Pellegrino passed by and he's just like, oh, yeah, I, don't, I, I just, I don't like that guy. You know, like that, that. <laughs> That's them. They were just like that's yeah. and that's why people either love them or hate them because they're idiots that get in street fights or it's like, damn, that dude's down. He'll fucking fight anybody. Yeah. And the Diaz brothers have a different vibe. I mean, there's a little bit more just <laughs> unintentional comedy and, and weirdness about them because they're they're kind of oddball guys. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, on top of of being uh, great fighters, but it's it's the same thing. And I was actually working around towards the Masvidal Diaz fight in that. What happened during the Masvidal Diaz fight? Like everyone was almost disappointed that yeah. the publicity campaign was so ho hum, and it's because neither of them was going to pretend that they didn't like the other. They were like, "I respect this guy, and we're about to go cash a big check together." That was that was pretty much the entire thing, and they did cash a big check, and the fight was pretty exciting while it lasted. But neither the fight nor the buildup were the explosive barn burner that they were supposed to be. Because Masvidal wasn't going to fake it, and certainly neither was Diaz. Here, it is hard for me to believe that Masvidal all of a sudden just can't stand Usman so bad that he wants to yell on his face. Because when he legitimately didn't like somebody, dude, he did not like Ben Askren. He he hit him. He almost hit him. Yeah, Askren annoyed the hell out of Masvidal, and Masvidal said very, very little, and he said less and less as it got closer to the fight. And uh, even, like bailed on one of the last press conferences and Dana was just like, no, he cleared it with me beforehand. He, he's just tired of doing publicity. And he was just, you know, kind of marking off every, like every one of Ben Askren's one liners, you know, he was marking them off on his little sheet in his head and he took it all out on him in five seconds. That is what it looks like when Jorge Masvidal doesn't like you. Yeah, and the that Billy terrifies- Madison list on the wall. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he's people to kill. <laughs> and that, that's what terrifies me, because if I were a fighter, I'd be like Ben Askren. I'd be the annoying dork that, like, the real hard dude would just completely take out all his frustrations on. <laughs> so so I, I feel for Ben Askren. He is my namesake, <laughs> and he is my, soul, my soulmate. But, uh, yeah, so long way around to say that the whole thing definitely felt forced and contrived to me. And that, that's kind of disappointing because it's not what I want from either guy. Right. I want Masvidal to occasionally unintentionally say funny things. Other times just to unintentionally say really real and insightful things and fight his ass off. And I want Usman to like grind everybody in the 170 pound division into dust and then put on the best suits in all of MMA. <laughs> since at, at least since you know Yoshihiro Akiyama's like heyday, that that's yeah. what I want from him. No love for Connor, huh? Yeah. 
I did like <laughs> his one with the pinstripes where when you got up real close, like some of the professional like Getty out. photos, they, they, like the pinstripes actually said fuck you in like four point font, like oh, yeah. all the way down. Like I want that suit, even though I'd probably stretch it out and people could read the fuck you and I, I'd get in trouble. <laughs> but <laughs> uh. oh man. So, shall we move on from that one? Sure. The Professional Fighters League has partnered with several regional promotions in countries like Russia and Germany to make tournaments and sign the winners of those tournaments to PFL's next million dollar seasons. Is this kind of thing, I, do you like it? How do you feel about it? Is it something more promotions should be looking at doing? You know, I love it and I hate it. And, and that, that's kind of funny to say because of how much I personally enjoy the Contender Series. Uh, and, and the reason why I bring that up, it's, it's, this is a perfect way to develop and put international talent on the map. By, by co-promoting with an organization, you can slap the PFL logo on it, get, you know, 50,000 people on ESPN Plus to tune into some, some you know, three, after, three in the afternoon event going on in the UAE or something. Uh, what better way than develop talent by throwing, slapping on a, a four-man or, or four-fighter, because it, women's lightweight as well, a uh, one-night tournament at some place, and then sign the winner. They've already gone through a tournament to join your tournament. Okay, that's kind of cool. I mean, what happened to the what was it called the Road to UFC that what the UFC did for a few minutes in Asia and actually tried to work with that and then it disintegrated. Uh, you know, every promotion, every major promotion seems to have their own developmental strategy. UFC has contender series. They had tough. They have looking for a fight, which got a couple. Randy Brown. He, I mean, Sage obviously, but Sage moved on. Uh, you know, Bellator, Bellator strategy is a little mean spirited where they'll sign O and O or O and one or no little newbies on the prelims of a 20 fight card and bury them at, at six in the six, at 6 PM or, or, or on Bellator Europe, you're, you can only watch the fight on the phone at 1130 AM. And if you do well, and they'll, they'll, they'll just throw 10 prospects on the card. So someone's got to do something. So that's their way. PFL buys their way into organizations and and makes tournaments happen. Ryzen and One have Pancrase. They have Shudo. They can kind of farm there. So I like it, but I also hate it because it pulls fighters that may, or it, it has had the effect of pulling fighters that aren't ready for the major, major, major stage yet. But they are on the major stage because they did something spectacular on one night. Like the PFL had uh, Siggy Pesolelli, who was a, I think, I think the promotion said he was 4-1 or coming into the tournament. I personally could not find a single one of those bonus three fights that were on his record. But they threw him onto the thing. And what happened? Well, he lost. He lost. He got onto the playoffs by injury replacement, and he lost. So a one and no guy gets in the playoffs. What happens? Do we really need that? So I, I don't know. I, I think it's an interesting way to develop talent, but thrusting them into the tournament, I don't know. I just feel like it could be early. Do you have any take on this, Juice? Sorry about that. Um, it's just a uh, PFL. I mean, PFL will always be World Series of Fighting to me. Yeah. And I remember that they had uh, something similar in Asia, too. They had a... a, a the World Asian Series of Fighting French. GC? I believe that's what it was called, yeah. Yep. And I think it was mostly in Asia, right? I, I yep. got that right? Yeah. Yep. So I guess this is a new for them. And then, you know, you said that they were going to be in Russia. Obviously, Ali Abdelaziz has connections with uh, some... <laughs> Dubious figures in Russia, uh, one of whom may or may not be connected to a recent murder of a Russian uh, political type, but we won't. We don't need to talk about that. But um, yeah, it just it. it I guess it just kind of irks me. I hear PFL and foreign, and uh, I get a little Trumpian with that stuff. (laughs) (laughs) It. Well, it is the great, a, the great the great people of Kansas are very proud of you right now. <laughs> it, is hey, a, <laughs> it, it is actually a really good point not to lose track all the way. I think that is a really good point you raised though about about the management team uh, to set up these tournaments because we know full well 
that some of these managers that were supposedly ejected from PFL altogether are not are not at all, and they're still very much involved in the process. So yeah, this that's a, a foil I didn't think of that they may be a six and zero dominant MMA prospect that happens to fight in so and so region. Ooh, yeah, I don't, I don't. I hope it isn't that because then I, no, no, thank you. I want to give a shout out to uh, uh, what was his name, uh, My- Magomed Bibulatov. I've mentioned him a few times on Twitter, and he always gets at me. Like maybe two or three days later, but he's always mentioning something about how a gay zone exists in Chechnya. Dude, and, dude yeah. hi- hide your face a little better behind that. <laughs> yeah, <mic> man. <laughs> before he comes and black bags you and takes you out to the woods. <laughs> yeah, I made reference to that. He doesn't. He doesn't like that. I don't know. Apparently, it didn't happen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I try to. I try to keep that on the DL. But yeah, that shit has happened a few times. Juice is about to take a polonium tip dart to the neck. Like, close all your windows right now. <laughs> oh, they're closed. Don't worry. Watch okay, for a, a closed umbrella in the rain. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> wow. All right. So, enjoying the, the final appearance of Juice Vargas on our show before his untimely death. It's been fun, Juice. Really has. It really, it really <laughs> has. I'm glad that you were our first three-time, like, guest. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, there's, before, there's no reason before the, for my madness. Before the, the, the world's most terrifying uh, flyweight, like, you know, snuffed you out. <laughs> yeah, okay. Yeah, that is something that has happened, though. Yep. What is uh, it about? <laughs> coming up this weekend, we have UFC 247. It begins a stretch of eight straight weeks of UFC cards. Uh, but they're starting off with a bang. A title doubleheader headlined by John Jones versus Dominic Reyes. And in the co-main event, Valentina Shevchenko versus Caitlin Chukagian. Valentina will be a... She's hovering around a minus 1,100 favorite over Chukagian right now. This is her third title defense. In all three of the title defenses, she is closed as at least a 10-to-1 favorite. Juice, who... For those viewers that might not know, he is quite the mind on women's MMA. Just watches it, analyzes it, kn- knows a lot about the fighters. Should she be this big a favorite against Jukagian? And does Jukagian bring any significant threats that her two previous title challengers have not? She should be as big a favorite. And no, she doesn't bring anything new to the table because I've always, I've always uh, penned Chukagian as like a mini uh, Holly Holm, and I really expect this fight to look very similar to Shevchenko's fight with Holly Holm. Uh, they're so similar, and not just in their key eyeing and stuff. I mean, the the kicks, the um, circular footwork, the uh, the the gas tank. They, I mean, the the volume. Although I will say, I guess Chukagian has a bit more volume. But it's nothing that Shevchenko hasn't seen before. She doesn't have dynamic, like, accuracy or uh, re- real big power or anything to really threaten her with. Yeah, I mean, she deserves to be as big a favorite. But I also think she's gonna be, just going to be this big a favorite for a while. And I'm not saying this as the whole she's going to be undefeated at flyweight and she's going to be this the queen of the division for years on end. It, this is just what happens. I think especially within the women's divisions, when they come up, like it takes a while for them to get talent. Ronda's fights when the first, then uh, when the uh, division first got announced was like that. Yun Jacek's fights were like that. Shashenko just the next in the list. And um, yeah, I think it's going to be a, maybe another two or three fights till we see anyone that can really challenge her. Uh, I, I think the, uh, people say that flyweight's really weak, and as of right now, I mean it's it's definitely not strong. But there's a lot of there's a lot of talent there, and there's still a lot of promotions that have a lot of good flyweight talent. So I think it's just a matter of time before UFC signs more girls. You get some you know, prospects like Sabina Mazo, and you know as much as they may not like Macy Barber, I'm I'm not a fool. I know that that she can go far in this in the sport and in this division. So. There's definitely people there that can probably present her challenges, but it's going to be a bit. What's your call for fight of the night? 
Uh, I'm trying to think off the top of my head. I know there's. I think there was the fight that was opening up the main card. I'm trying to remember what it was. Uh, the main card was Lewis uh, Lewis uh, Latifi. Latifi, you know what? That <laughs> okay? So it was. Yeah, I think that might be the the uh, fight of the night because that shit should just be fun, man. There's gonna be nothing but haymakers, but god damn it, is it gonna be fun? <laughs> That's just gonna be dope, man. And then just they're just odd looking fellas as it is, man. You know, <laughs> just, just you got you got the Texan boy and fucking Derek Lewis, and then you got Latifi, who's just I mean, everyone I guess just because of the horse, everyone just is always gonna look at him kind of funny. Yeah, it's <laughs> it's gonna be a uh, that should be interesting. That's that's my kind of fight right there. Even on the horse, I think he would be shorter than Lewis, and he would lose. <laughs> <laughs> Even if let him bring the horse, I mean, not tipping my hand on how I'm gonna pick that fight, but <laughs> Jay, mm. uh, is is the woman we call Bullet a righteous uh, eleven to one favorite? You know, her being such a, a, a an unbelievable favorite is a little surprising to me because I can't think of of, of, of champions, champions that have been that level of massive favorite over their challengers. Uh, Cyborg, when Cyborg fought her her opponents in the UFC, she was only a favorite like that against non-titles. Uh, Leslie Smith, um, uh, Tony, uh, Tanya Avenger, I think she may have been before she won the belt. Um, Rousey only cracked one, uh, minus 1,000 when, against Betch Uh I, I think you want to go on Jacek. I don't know if she cracked 1,000. So while overwhelming favorite, we've had some of those champs in the past. They're, they're, they're just re- wrecking shop. To, to, to be that big of a favorite in MMA is very unusual. Uh, boxing, you know, boxing, you can have 40 to 1 favorites on a Saturday night random card. But to have a, a mega ultra favorite like this in the UFC for a championship is surprising. That being said, I, I, I don't know. I can't see a path to victory for, for Chukagian. I think of the opponents that Shevchenko has faced in the relatively recent past. Uh, and, and I don't see her doing something better than other opponents did. Uh, Young Jacek is a better striker, more technical. The only difference is that uh, Chukagin has a little bit more size, so maybe if she can land volume backing uh, Shevchenko away. But it, I, I, I don't see the, 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 her skill set posing the big threat against Shevchenko that everybody wants. I, I, I don't... I don't want to say she has not much to no chance, but statistically speaking, puncher's chances in women's divisions are unusual. Uh, I think that Shevchenko has one of the only knockouts, KO knockouts, in flyweight history in the women's division, and that was when she kicked, uh, she she planked Jessica I in a title fight. Now, circling around to to the fight of the night, I I, I have a couple thoughts on the card. Look at UFC 246, the Connor Cowboy card. We had a big fight. We had an ex-champion fighting somebody or a, or a lower, like a top three-ish kind of thing. We had a heavyweight slot fest. We had a striker's delight fight of the night. And we had a borderline top 10 matchup. You can picture all the matchups in your head. Uh, and Holm Pennington was the championship level. Uh, Atlantic Green was the slot fest. Gadelia Grasso was going to be the borderline top 10, but that got scratched. And Pettis Fajeda was the striker's delight. The fight of the night, the fight of the night bait, if you want to call it that. Well, 247, big fight, John Jones, ex champion or high other medium, medium tier championship level fight, obviously. Uh, the heavyweight slot fest, Juan Adams and, and, and uh, Justin Taffa. Striker's delight, fight of the night candidate, which is my candidate, is Danny Ige versus Merced Bektik. I think that could be fireworks. And the borderline top 10 matchup which is Louis Latifi. So it's a formula. The UFC seems to be getting into this groove and I don't like it because I don't want to be able to predict what's going to happen or how the UFC is going to make a card because then it turns into boxing for me. Uh, I, 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 for as big of a card as it should be, it doesn't have the big card feel. And I, I, this is coming from somebody who said that for two forty six. Uh, you know, I will, we'll probably get into this a little more, 
but I, I don't know why I expected more from the card lineup, but it feels like you got to do some digging and you can find some really good stuff in, in, in them, their hills, but it's, it's a very unusual fight card for me, but at the same time, it is completely usual. I mean, would you call this the kind of card that you would travel from Pennsylvania to Texas to witness in person? You know, I wouldn't actually, but here we go. Well, too, 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 late, too late. Cause you did. Let's get weird. <laughs> uh, for myself, I'm actually I'm on board with Shevchenko being as big a favorite as she is. It's too easy, and, and it's just too pat an answer to say that. Well, hey, you know, Chikagian is thirteen and two, and her two losses are to Shevchenko's two previous title challengers because both those fights were a long time ago, and stylistically they were very different, but. I would. I did not pick Holly Holm to beat Ronda Rousey when she did, but the style, like the the stylistic difference, was there. And Rousey had apparent holes in her game that were ripe to be exploited at some point by somebody. And again, I didn't pick it to be home then, or I would be sitting in a bigger house right now. <laughs> when I look. At Shevchenko, the thing that makes her, ironically, the thing that, that makes her such a righteous favorite in these fights is that for someone nicknamed Bullet, her game is fairly bulletproof at flyweight. She doesn't have any screaming deficiencies. She doesn't make stupid mistakes. Nobody catches her with something silly. Like the time she's lost in her career, she's been just flat out beaten by a better fighter and usually a bigger fighter named Amanda Nunes. So, I mean, the, the best version of Jukagian could come out and fight her best fight, and it just might not be enough to beat Valentina Shevchenko right now, and that's what an 11-1 to favorite fight looks like in my book. For Fight of the Night, maybe it's just because I have my head so far up the butt of Texas MMA that I can't see anything else, but this looks like a loaded card to me. We've got a couple of undefeated dudes from Dallas coming in, including a uh, new signee, Austin Lingo, and Miles Johns. This thing is heavily uh, saturated with Houston guys. And again, yeah. I live in Houston. I go to fights in Houston. Uh, my, my call for fight of the night, I mean, the obvious one would be Mursad Bektich versus Dan Ige. Neither of those guys seems to know how to put on a boring fight. But I'm going to go with Alex Morano versus Caleb Williams. You've got a late notice replacement in Williams who is, he's going to come in like a house on fire. He has nothing to lose against Morano and Alex Morano. I don't know if he will ever be a top 10 welterweight. I don't know if he will ever challenge for a title. Uh, I went and interviewed him at his gym a couple days ago and that feature will be up on sure dog this week, but he has some very interesting and unorthodox career and life goals in mind. That, that I think you'll find amusing if you go and find that article. But long story short, for a guy that is known as a Brazilian jiu-jitsu black belt who literally owns and operates a Gracie Baja location up here, like you see dudes in their geese and their trunks with Alex Morano's name on there because he is their coach, he does not think of himself as primarily a grappler. He is there to knock you the hell out. And his black belt in jiu-jitsu is his fallback if you shoot for a takedown. I think that fight has fireworks written all over it. Uh, and whether that fight goes two minutes or it goes the distance, that's my call for fight of the night. N in no way a, a loaded question, but how do you feel about the UFC marketing John Jones by calling him an undefeated fighter, Juice? <laughs> Why'd you go to me first on that one? I don't know. I don't know. Sorry. Just, just, try, just try, to keep you on, try to keep you on your toes. That's funny. Um, yeah, I mean, like, I, I've talked about this on my show. It's just it's, it's just weird. And I think it's just... I actually think this is a... As you said, it is. A, it kind of is a loaded question, but maybe not in the way of John Jones fuckery and the UFC, you know, having his back... For, for better or worse and all that type of shit. I it's 
I think it's just we're just in a weird era right now. It really is turning into boxing right now because, you know, uh, Adesanya is fighting Romero next. Uh, the word is strong that Cejudo is going to fight Aldo next, both coming off losses. I remember when DC fought Gustafson a few years ago off of a loss, people were irate. And I was one of those people until maybe like a week or two before the fight, I realized I'm like, wait, Gustafson got fucked over a few times. You know, he was supposed to have an immediate rematch with Jones and then all his stuff had come out. And then I'm like, you know what? He's he's He may not be deserving of this title shot, but there's worse people you could give it to. And But that was like a one-off. And now it's like, it seems it's just like, oh, it's whoever the champion wants. It's whatever sells. It's So I think they're just doing this thing of like, like I've heard things with, with people like Romero, a lot of people are saying that Romero is the best middleweight of all time, that he surpassed Anderson and that he's had uh, better uh, quality matchups and he didn't really lose to, <laughs> he didn't really lose to Whitaker the first time and definitely not the second time. And it's just like, you can't just rewrite history just because you like a dude. But yep. that seems to be the thing, you know. And then, like, even with Aldo, I understand Aldo's a very beloved figure, but it's like, oh, well, the Connor thing was only 13 seconds. And then, you know, Holloway's the new age, but then he didn't really lose to Marais. And even in that fight, man, just to just to talk about that one real quick, I I don't think he really lost to Marais, but I don't think it was a robbery like a lot of people say. So, I don't know. I, I really just think we're just in this new age. It's just We're just going to call them and, and make them what we think they are, regardless of what the record books show because people just want to see fighters they recognize, you know, it's almost going like that Bellator path of like, these are recognizable names. So those are the ones we're going to put up instead of the deserving number one contenders. And I mean, I'll jump in with my take on this and then like uh, hand it over to you, Jay, but I, I think it's almost, it's unfortunate and it's unnecessary. There, there's no need to rewrite John Jones's history. He is, I mean, I, I've been on record as saying I think he is well on his way to being the greatest fighter of all time. His personal mistakes and missteps inside and outside the cage and all, before it is all said and done, I have the feeling we're going to be calling him the greatest fighter of all time. There's no need to dress that up. There's no need to paper over his weird early career loss. If anything... It adds a little spice to the gumbo. I mean, I'm old enough both in absolute years and in years of being a fan of this sport that I remember looking at when, like, Fedor Emelianenko was 24-1. and one. I'm like, well, hell, who's the one? And I went and looked it up, and looking into that and realizing how badly he got jobbed and what a piece of just kind of regulatory fuckery it was, yeah, where he got sliced open by an strictly speaking illegal elbow and his opponent only was credited with a win because they were in the middle of a tournament and one guy had to advance and Fedor had a big cut on his head. I mean, really the, the greatest heavyweight of all time is Fedor's skin because it really is, is the only thing that's beaten Fedor uh, <laughs> through the first 15 years of his career. But like l having to go and, acquaint myself with what actually happened only made me respect him more. I'm like, well, holy shit. This guy's the greatest fighter of all time. He should be 30 and 0 right now. And I was all mad. If that loss had been papered over and he was just some, you know, 26, 27 and 0 guy, you can always bring in the question, well, maybe he just hasn't fought the right guy yet. So I, I feel the same way about Jones's record. Yeah. Jones's only quote unquote loss is in a fight where he was absolutely pasting a guy and through a very narrow interpretation of uh, MMA rules. I won't even say unified rules because I, I don't think we were on the unified rules yet. You know, he, he was given an L and he would have won a rematch the next night and he would have won a rematch a week after a month after a year after today Anytime. It was the flukiest of fluky outcomes. Let it stand. Let people figure out what really happened and just appreciate John Jones's greatness even that much more. Nobody needs to rewrite history for this, and I'm not comfortable with people trying to do it. Man, I, you, 
you're 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 speaking my language here. I I don't have a ton to say. It 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 doesn't it doesn't feel right. And 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 I say that not just as a guy that that runs fight you uh, the Sherdog Fight Finder, and you can look at Sherdog Fight Finder and John Jones' profile and see a big L with the red and the disqualification next to his name because of what happened. It you can't go back and and say well it wasn't legit or it wasn't or Mas- it was I think it was Steve Masagati right it was. Yes. Yamasaki, was, right? was, yeah, I thought yeah, it was Steve Masagati. It was, it was Masagati. Yeah, I thought it was Masagati. He didn't apply the rules properly, or he should have stopped the fighter. Should have, should have, should have. No. The result stands as it has stood for 11 years now. I think it was in 2009, but the point was it was the, the previous decade. But it, it happened. You know, we can't not say it happened because we need to promote him differently. And and to do that it just feels disingenuous. It feels wrong. It it, it feels it, it feels it's false. It is because it is truly false. It it's not a technicality. It's not a. It just go okay. Fine. He was winning the fight, and he was ruining uh, Matt Hamill, and he threw a legal strike or strikes, and was disqualified. Well, that's the end of the discussion. You know, it, it's it's kind of like uh, looking at MMADecisions.com to say why you believe fighter A actually won this fight. Well, media scorecards that score the fights are not doing so in an official judicial capacity. The three judges that score the fight, the referee that's in charge of the fight, the commission that oversees them is the only one that has anything to do with it. Promoter doesn't like it, fighter doesn't like it, fans don't like it, who cares? We have to have that kind of system in place, otherwise one championship will just literally overturn decisions because they thought their fighter won. This has actually happened multiple times. So, no, mm-hmm. I, I I don't like it. I, I it's 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 misleading and it's it's factually inaccurate. So why why do you have to say he's undefeated? Why can't you just show the things he's done? You can you can literally show footage of him smearing Matt Hamill. Just cut it out before the DQ because he still was beating the brakes off of that poor man. If you really have to show footage or whatever, just just don't lie to me. It's not fair. So it doesn't make sense. There are going to be uh, uh, Conor McGregor era fans who will now think that John Jones is an undefeated fighter with zero losses because undefeated means zero losses. It doesn't mean, yep. well, he wasn't, well, he, the only man to beat John Jones with John Jones, he still has a loss in his record. So it's silly. Yep. I, I don't. I don't. I don't see it. And you know they could make a subjective judgment call out of it. Like Joe Rogan could say in the voiceover, "The scissor wheel. Nobody's ever beaten this guy in the cage." And I would say nothing about it. I'm. I'm fine with that. Yep. Yep. Because it's not. It's not like. It's not like Matt Hamill got up and like raised his arms. Right. <laughs> right. He, uh, he stayed right on the fucking ground where he yeah, was. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know no, he was done. <laughs> And believe it or not, like, I mean, I know this is kind of a different subject, but the UFC has kind of done something where, like, people were actually praised them for, quote unquote, rewriting history. Like, in the case of Dwayne Ludwig with his, uh, remember, he had the fastest knockout before Six Masvidal seconds. did. You yeah. know, the commission did not get that one right. So right. they said he, he has the fastest knockout. According to any real metric, the commission just fucked up here. And and people respected that. Like, all right, cool. He does deserve that because he did get kind of get screwed over. But it's not like they were trying to overtake, you know, try, trying to give the win to Jonathan Goulet because it was too fast and it didn't count or some shit. <laughs> Goulet wasn't ready. We're going <laughs> to. Yeah. Do over. No contest. They were supposed to touch gloves and they didn't. No. Mm-hmm. no, like, and you know what? I'm a guy that was like. I mean, for what it was worth, I was happy when, like, Dana put out that little video where he's watching the video of the fight with the stopwatch, and he's like, whatever they say, you know, officially in our books, Bang Ludwig has the fastest knockout of all time. I love that. But that was a low-stakes thing. That was yeah, not calling exactly. one of your champions. That's right. Yeah. Anyway, you, you you guys have already said it better than I could. Uh, are we ready for the speed bag? Fire. Like I'm not, I'm not even gonna be as exacting as Ant Walker. We are out from under his extremely authoritarian thumb. Everybody gets thirty seconds or less per question. Like, don't feel like you have to talk for thirty seconds, but you may talk for thirty seconds. And there will be three questions. 
30 seconds apiece. And then at the end, I will answer all three questions in roughly 90 seconds. We'll start with you on this one, Jay. Jay, why is Juan Adams versus Justin Taffa on the UFC 247 pay-per-view main card? And go. You know, UFC wants a knockout. I would say, statistically speaking, that fight is the most likely to end by knockout. So to me, that's just the one that makes sense. Ding. 14 seconds. I'm Excellent. keeping them brief if I can. Juice, why is Juan Adams versus Justin Taffa on the UFC 247 pay-per-view main card? Go. Uh, I'm, I'm really probably just going to parrot what Jay just said because I can't think of a better answer. I mean, Taffa got you know, bodied by DeCastro <laughs> in his last fight. And then uh, Juan Adams lost to Greg Harden in his last fight, if I recall correctly, right? I mean, yep. uh, yeah, I think it's just, it's it's a combustible, a combustible matchup that should produce a KO. And if it doesn't, people are going to be going to, you know, take a piss or get beer very quickly. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's what that fight is meant for. It's either a piss break or it's going to be an exciting that's knockout. 30 seconds. No, stop, stop. <laughs> that was 30 seconds. Holy shit. <laughs> Actually, you, you had go. to circle back seconds. around to reinforce it. Yep. All right. Question number two. In light of his recent revelations of a serious brain health issue that threatens his fight career going forward, what should be next for Rafael Lovato Jr. and the Bellator middleweight division? We'll start with you, Juice, and go. Um, yeah, I, I I didn't catch that that interview, but I read excerpts and yeah, uh, I I don't know. I guess tournament. That seems what Bellator has been wanting to do lately. Uh, it seems most appropriate. All right, beautiful, Jay. What's next for uh, Rafael El Sharpe, Lovato Jr., and the Bellator middleweight division? Man, if I were told I had a brain irregularity or problem or issue and covering sports for whatever reason exacerbated it and would, would, would end up killing me, I'd get out of sports media coverage. So, yeah, I think that Lovato should do whatever he needs to do to take care of his health because that comes first. As for whatever happens next, as long as they don't make champ champ thing again with Lima, I'm good. Excellent. Third question, and we'll start with you on this one, Jay. Former Strike Force Bellator UFC lightweight Josh Thompson officially retired uh, officially announced his retirement this week. How will you remember the career of the punk? And go. Man, he is the Strike Force US champion. And he did so by beating the legendary Nam fan. So that's what I will always remember him for. Who did Nam fan pick to win? He probably picked like Gilbert Melendez or something. He probably picked himself because then he was wrong and that would be in keeping <laughs> with all of his like <laughs> I'm sorry, how will you remember his career? That's it. Strike Force U.S. champion, baby. Beautiful. All right. I will try to address all three of these questions. What about uh, Juice? Why... Oh, Juice. Jesus. I'm so sorry. <laughs> juice, Jesus. Please encapsulate the career of Josh the Punk Thompson in 30 seconds or less and go. Uh, I guess in three quick things. Uh, one, Tony Ferguson's elbows. Two, um, the Ben Henderson fight because I've never seen it and I know it was a controversial deci decision and I should watch it, but I never have. And three, Joe Rogan always mentioning at any given time that he grabbed his own glove to choke out some dude in Strike Force. <laughs> <laughs> Those are three amazing anecdotes, like oh, just man. three snapshots for the, the, the scrapbook. Wow, that's one of the best speedbag answers I can remember yeah, in I the history it. of the show. I dig that. I dig Thank that you. a lot. Like, I have so, we're going to have you, like, on this show eight times before we ever get Rune on here. <laughs> You're just so good at this shit. Thank you. Thank you. I well, actually that, flattered. <laughs> uh, all right. I, I will knock out all three of these questions in uh, an indeterminate amount of time. Why is Ju is Juan Adams versus, versus Justin Taffa on the main card? Ding. What, what you've already said, heavyweight slot fest, plus Juan Adams is a very, very Houston guy. He is 
popular and well known around here. He is at the table doing color commentary for Fury Fighting Championships, which is Houston's number one promotion with a bullet. Uh, this is fan service. He, this is Houston. What should be next for Lovato and the middleweight division? Uh, for Lovato, it should be uh, some shelf time until he gets some kind of clearance from a doctor because this does not seem to be well understood by anyone for the Bellator middleweight division. Much as I hate the whole champ champ thing, Lima was calling for a middleweight title shot, citing the dearth of high-level welterweight contenders as far back as December. Now is the time to do Lima versus Musasi for the uh, vacant title. And Josh Thompson officially announced his retirement this week. How will you remember his career? I will remember him, one, as behind Dominic Cruz and his longtime teammate, Cain Velasquez, both of whom are ahead of him because they actually won UFC titles. One of the greatest injury-based what might have been stories in, M in MMA history. When he was healthy for about a 10-year stretch, I don't care where he was, he was possibly the best lightweight in the sport i mean his few flashes of greatness in the cage and some of the stories that leaked Dang. out about him uh bodying people at aka both teammates as well as visiting luminaries are shocking i mean i i wish we'd gotten to see what a healthy josh thompson could have done in a two or three year stretch and finally, my greatest memory of Josh Thompson will be his Twitter meltdown on election night 2012 as Obama won the second term. I knew that would come. I, Someone I, I just, sure just, I, 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 <laughs> I love it. I, I mean, it. I don't let my I don't let my politics bubble up to the surface very often. Anybody that listens to me talk for long enough can figure out what they are. But watching Josh just completely lose his shit and proclaim the death of the country and oh my god. He's no, the most Idaho seen. guy ever. The Idaho or Iowa? Idaho. He's Idaho. from Idaho. Idaho. Oh, okay. okay. Idaho. I thought he was Iowa for some reason. He, he's, he's from Idaho. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> with all that out of the way, we should probably jump to our final segment, which is Buried Treasure, talking about the MMA or combat sports story in the past week that should have received greater coverage and has not received greater coverage thus far. I'll actually jump in first. I don't know whether this is buried or it's just treasure too fresh to have really bubbled to the top of the news cycle, but Bellator MMA, uh, within the last two or three days, signed Wyatt Barber, the younger brother of UFC flyweight contender Macy Barber, oh, to shit. a contract. Okay, right out of the gate, Wyatt Barber is not Macy Barber. No. He is 18 years old. I mean, yep. he's only 21. Yes. Yeah, he's 18 years old. He's 0-0 as a pro. He fought once in LFA last summer and dusted some dude. He is a featherweight. So while she is a flyweight in possibly the thinnest division in the UFC, he is a featherweight, one of the two or three <laughs> hardest divisions. So there is no guarantee that he's the next Macy Barber. By the time Macy even got onto the Contender Series... She was 4-0 as a pro and had killed four people and then killed another person. Well, she had one decision in LFA, but, you know, three brutal finishes uh, and a dominant decision and then brutalized somebody on the Contender Series and then moved on to the UFC. This is an 0-0 guy who is really being signed on name value and it's really his sister's name value. Nonetheless, he has come up through the same program. They are... I, I feel like we'll look at the Barbers, weird sports parents and all, as prototypes of the next generation of mixed martial artists. Oh, God. Oh God. I'm just, I, I'm, I'm saying, you know, we're, we're not that far removed from the first people who came into this sport training in MMA, not people who were doing karate and then crossed over or doing jujitsu and crossed over or college wrestlers who moved in, but just... People who, from the time they were a small child, were training in all UFC, the... bro. Yes. So I, I don't know whether he is... Oh, my God. I can't say the future because his... <laughs> <laughs> fuck. Fuck this whole story. God, I hate... This. Can, I just, can I just bury this story again? 
Right. Can I just go right dig, a hole, dig a hole and put the story right back in it. <laughs> you just exhumed it. And you're just I, I exhumed it. I exhumed it. It smells bad. I agree with the coroner's assessment. I, let's just close the lid on this. No, I, I don't know whether Wyatt Barber is a future contender in Bellator or anywhere else. Uh, but certainly, I mean, his signing on nothing other than some promise, one amateur uh, victory, which was dominant, and his sister's name is noteworthy, and I guess we'll see what comes of it. So that's my buried treasure for the week. <laughs> Juice, what do you have for us? Well, apparently uh, Desmond Green, who it seems a lot of people have forgotten. <laughs> uh, yeah, some uh, some people in Florida, unfortunately. Yeah, well... If you guys don't remember, he was convicted of a DUI manslaughter, uh, I want to say about a year ago. Uh, killed uh, two or three people, was under the influence of God knows how many substances and had drugs in the car. I mean, it's it really is amazing that he's not, that, well, that he was free. And yeah, that's part of the story. He's been free. Well, he hasn't been convicted <laughs> yet. He's just on trial soon. He's on trial. Yeah, so he's been out on bail and I don't know, it's just... I understand he quote unquote didn't mean to, you know, I know it's manslaughter. That's what happens, but Jesus Christ, he still killed numerous people. And, um, he was just caught up because he was driving like an idiot and got pulled over. And one of the conditions of his, uh, a bond was that he cannot be driving anything. He cannot be conducting any kind of vehicle. And he was, and he was still driving erratically and uh, so back in the slammer and God knows how this is going to work. I mean, it's not going to work out well for sure. It's just a matter of how bad is it going to be for him. I guess he's not going to be taking that ACA fight anytime soon then. <laughs> and, and, <laughs> and in ACA, we're talking about an organization <laughs> yeah. that was quick to assure us yeah. that Alexander Emelian Echo is totally still on the card. You. Oh, oh. man. I even though, he just, even though he just spent a week in jail for, like, yeah. being on a drunken rampage at 9 in the morning somewhere. <laughs> so we're talking about a really low standard of good citizenship that you, that you have to be on. But, yeah, I have the feeling that Desmond Green is going gonna, is gonna to miss that, uh, that roll call. Yeah, it's just it's it's just so amazing to me that, that people forgot. I understand he's not John Jones. We think... Drunken foolery in MMA, we think John Jones. I understand that spot's kind of, that mantle's kind of been taken. <laughs> but what Desmond Green did is 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 terrible. It, it it's it's horrific. And you know, I know he's not wasn't very famous in the UFC and uh wherever else he may have fought, but he was a promising guy. Uh he he definitely had talent, and then this happened and I mean, I, I think you could basically kiss his MMA career goodbye. I don't know how old he is, but whatever's going to happen to him, he's not going to be in prime shape when he gets out. And, uh, it, yeah, this this fi this story flew under the radar when it initially happened and definitely flew under the radar right now that he got caught up once again driving. So I think if there's anyone that's – there's any silver lining to this, it may be with John Jones that he can just be like, well, I haven't done the most questionable things behind the wheel. Whew. Can I interject something real quick before you go to your buried treasure, Jay? Fire. It's interesting to me how much a comparison of anybody or, or fighter X with John Jones has changed in the last year or two. I mean, yeah. if I were to ask you, yes or no, buy or sell right now, John Jones ever gets arrested again, what what, what do you say? See, now, now it's the question, isn't it? I'm going to say buy, but I'm not yeah. a normal person in the No, sphere. me too. Me too. I'd yeah. buy it. I'd Dude, buy you it. and I are you are unicorns in I'm, this field. I'm not though. buying it. I I think Jones has moved to a different point in his uh, in his development as, as a person. And I'm not here to say he's some redemption story or he's a great person now. But I think for whatever reason, whether he is a changed person or he is just a cynical 32 year old athlete who is like, I have got to white knuckle this for the next five <laughs> years and get as much money and legacy as I can out of my day job, which is fighting. 
I think we're done with the stories of John Jones fucking up big time and publicly. And, you know, I will absolutely repost this episode. You know, if he like runs over Desmond Green coming out of the courthouse in a week. <laughs> but he's going to drive to Florida to run his ass <laughs> over on fight week. John Jones would fucking do that. Yes, he would. <laughs> I'm, I'm just, I'm he's just partying saying, with like, Connor in Miami. He's gonna just snatch someone's phone and like throw it down under his own wheels for real quick first. <laughs> no, it, it, it's an it's an interesting thing because Jones has tried to tell us many times that he has learned his lesson and turned over a new leaf. Yes, and I'm to the point now where I'm ready to believe that he has turned over a new leaf, whether he has learned any lessons or not. But anyway, that's completely outside of everything. It's just that I suddenly found myself thinking while uh, Juice was telling us about Green that I'm not that guy anymore that's kind of waiting for John Jones to fuck up the next time. I think we're going to have kind of a cynical and cold-hearted iron grip on the light heavyweight or heavyweight title for the next X number of years, courtesy of the guy. But we will see what happens. I'll take it. I'm, I'm open to, to being proven wrong. I, I still consider John Jones fight week like getting tested for STDs when you've been, you know, just whoring around. It's not you, you're just waiting for that for that day to come. You just, <laughs> yeah. Let's, I, let's I, hope. You know, let's hope there's no bad results. You know, I I don't. I, maybe I'm speaking out of turn, but I I thought I remember a story last year where he was in a strip club and he was uh, karate ah. chopping genitals i i remember that it was such an uh, odd strange thing that that exotic dancers he was not quite assaulting but borderline assaulting assault. you've almost assault. you've almost answered my question but what i've got to ask is whose genitals <laughs> i don't know they didn't tell me i didn't ask him remember there was a video no. that never came to surface that, that was weird man yeah, yeah. that was and that and was then... last year too if I, yeah, if I remember correctly, I think it was a little bit before or after the Tiago Santos fight. I mean, I've yes, seen him, I thought too. I, I've seen him cross chop his own, but that, I mean, that's not the same. <laughs> what are you gonna do, Jake? Get steer this conversation out of the gutter right. and back on track. All right, I'll take us back. Treasure. I'll take us back. I'll take us back to Bellator because why not? Let's get weird. So, do you guys remember a heavyweight last year that competed in Bellator that found himself on a main card that was he was a one in one, forty year old somebody named J W Kaiser, and he was matched up against Jake Hager, the WWE crossover guy. I think his name was Jack Swagger in Swagger's or Hager's pro debut, and it was this guy who who. You know, he punched stuff and he was whatever, but he was a one in one 40 plus year old guy. He was obviously brought into job and he got arm triangled in a minute and a half. No big deal. Okay, fine. Since then, a 41 year old boxer guy who just got, I don't want to say embarrassed because Hager was a massive favorite, um, you know, got handled on live TV for his first big fight ever. You figure that's the kind of thing that says, okay, this isn't for me. Since then, this dude in 2019, oh, he, he fought Jake Hager in January of 2019. Since then, this guy has gone 4-0 and and knocked out four different guys in the first round in 2019 alone. So Oof. Bellator said, hey. So they have since, Bellator has since slated uh, to put Kaiser back on one of their cards in a card in uh, Thackerville, Oklahoma, their, their second home. And he'll be fighting uh, an O and O wrestling standout guy. They want to see if he can hack it again. So suddenly, this this one and one forty one year old boxer guy is now a forty two year old five and two knockout artist, just like that. And he's fighting an undefeated wrestler guy in Bellator. So what's going to happen? I don't know, but. That is a very surprising thing that a 40 plus year old guy is starting his career and have fought five times in 2019. There you go. That's awesome. And speaking personally, I found him like kind of a really winning guy on the mic in the, in yeah. the, up to the fight. He wasn't saying fight cliches, but he was saying stuff like I have nothing to lose. 
and I'm just going to go out there and leave it all on the line. But you believed it when he said it. It was it was some really real shit. You know, he he was saying the things that like every underdog says with a, an element of sincerity. So I'm super happy for the guy. And I had no idea until you told me <laughs> that he'd like gone on a tear since then. So hooray for us guys in our 40s. <laughs> Ain't over yet, pal. L- l- look out for me, you know, getting destroyed by Vitaly Minikov and Bellator like eight months from now. <laughs> <laughs> All right. That is it for this episode of Unleashed. And let this episode serve as a lesson to Anthony Walker that he does not need to leave the keys in my hand on such short notice, or this is what he gets. But nonetheless, we're going to close this up in a dignified and orderly fashion. And we're going to start with our special guest. Uh, and we do truly appreciate you uh, stepping up yeah. and joining us, Juice. Uh, you know, I will just embarrass myself right now and say that your podcast, the iFox with Juice uh, podcast, that I personally catch on uh, Spotify. As I've said many times, there are literally hundreds of fight podcasts out there. I catch about five of them on any kind of regular basis, and yours is one of them. Thank but you, please do tell all the good people where they can find you. Thank you, Ben, and thank you, Jay. You guys are very nice. You guys, uh, yeah, a lot of kind words my way, and and I was not expecting that. I came uh, last second uh, and invited me on, and something happened, but you guys are here, and I had a great time. So thank you, guys. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at Juice underscore MMA. Uh, the, yeah, my podcast is I Fox with Juice. I co-host it with uh, I host it with my my homegirl Reen. We drop it around Friday. We try to anyway every week. You can find a uh, that page also on Twitter at iFox with Juice. And uh, yeah, just uh, just thank you guys. Jay Petri, where can the good people find you both in the virtual electronic sense and physically in about a week? Go. Well, fancy you say that. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at, at Jay Petri. Uh, I post occasionally. And so. I'm about as active on Twitter as Ant Walker is on his Instagram. So, you know, take what you can get. <laughs> um, but you can find me more frequently on SureDog.com. I, I post regular, I write regularly, uh, stat features and betting odds, UFC play-by-play and Bellator play-by-play occasionally. Uh, and and I, I'm everywhere in the fight world you need me to be. However, this week, I'm in one location. I'll be in Houston, Texas, covering UFC 247 with a certain... Hopefully I'm pointing the right direction. We'll find out when the video comes out, which way I'm pointing as Mr. Duffy. Uh, and I will space providing and logistically speaking, writing live play by play for SureDog.com, which is something we have not done in many years uh, because of, you know, life finds a way. So this is going to be a real fun experience. We're looking forward to this. Uh, you can expect a lot of fun content. Uh for those of you that don't quite follow me well enough, I don't always ask the this, this standard normal questions. So you're going to get some weird and interesting things from the, some of these fighters this week. So I think you guys are really going to look forward to this because I really am. So, as Jay says, come watch SureDog get banned for another four years from <laughs> UFC events. Yes. A one and done, <laughs> baby. I'm Ben Duffy. Senior editor at SureDog.com. You can find me on Twitter at, at Benjamin Duffy. You can find me on the SureDog main page. I do a lot of different things there, but when a big fight card actually comes to my hometown of Houston, you're going to find me a few more places. So look out for exclusive interview features with UFC fighters and native Houstonians Alex Morano and Trevin Giles coming up this week. And look out for my on-the-spot fight coverage this weekend at the truly loaded UFC 247. But between now and next Tuesday, when you catch us next time, there are three things you must do. You must stay beautiful. You must stay positive. And above all else, you've got to stay sexy. Peace. <laughs>